All right, hello everybody. This is again Dr. Rogers Nogueira from University of Bahrain, Bahrain Teachers College. And welcome again to our course, Psychology of Learning. And we are now in the fifth module, and the title of our module is The Cognitive Theory of Learning in Teacher's Classroom. And what do we intend to, to learn for this module? First, we have to understand the fundamental principles and concepts of cognitive theory of learning in relationship to the child development in teacher's classroom. And the next one is use the theory to plan, implement, and evaluate classroom processes. When we talk about processes, we're talking about teaching, learning, assessment, and motivation. And use the theory to solve classroom cases. More specifically, we will try to to get into the case of the student we named Zainab. And for our keywords, uh, we are going to encounter these, these words in this module, cognition, assimilation, accommodation, equilibrium, information processing, and diversity. Now let's go into the most basic principles and uh, the uh, basic perspectives of cognitive theory of learning. Okay. Children are active and motivated learner. So by nature children children would would inquire. Children would find out what's happening. Okay. So by nature they are led into thinking. Next one is children are organize what they learn from their experiences. Children adapt to their environment through the process of assimilation and accommodation. So I'd like you to go back to the video that I have um, shared with you. And that will be enough to explain that. I don't have to elaborate on this anymore. And the next one is children learn by interacting with people and environment. So if you want to intensify learning, there's always had to be in relationship with people and the environment and their own environment. The next one is children connect what is in their mind and reality. So children always try to find out what is happening in their mind, at the same time link that to what's happening around them. Okay, what is happening outside their mind, which is the reality. And the next one is an increase of experience is an increase in learning. So take note of that. If children would are exposed to different aspects of life, different experiences, then we provide them an opportunity of increasing their learning. So it is important for us teachers to really create an experience for children. So that's not only about experience happening inside a classroom, but experiences, meaningful experiences happening outside the classroom. Learning is a process. It follows a specific stage. It matures as the brain matures. So the growth in learning, the development of, in learning also, I mean, grow, uh, grow side by side with the maturity of our brain. And the next one is children learn from mistakes. It is part of discovery. Take note of that. Children learn from mistakes. It is part of the discovery. Don't misconstrue that. Okay. And the next one is children's learning is developmental. Children continue to restructure their previous knowledge. So children keeps on building up their knowledge. And whatever they have learned in the past will always remain there. And children will would continue to make sense of that as they encounter new experiences or new knowledge. Next one is focus on listening, not on memorization. Take note of that. So it's not just learning, it goes beyond the memorization, which some, some teachers would mean would focus on. But cognition is more about reasoning. Right, let us look into some um, description of our key terms. 
cognition. Cognition, it is a process. It is a system of acquiring knowledge, being able to get knowledge. It is a process of reasoning, and it is a process of organizing information. Adaptation. It is the ability of the mind to adjust or fit in. So our mind would always adjust. It will, it will welcome information. It will welcome knowledge. And adaptation is assimilation and accommodation. So what do we mean by this? Assimilation is when new information is added into existing scheme or categories. Okay, so we keep on adding up, adding up and adding adding up information in our in our mind. Keep adding up more and more experiences, more experiences. Accommodation. Accommodation is about changing an existing scheme, concept, or idea to welcome new knowledge. Just for example, let's say we have an idea about a tree. But later on, giving more experiences, giving more information, giving more knowledge, now we understand the tree is not only about a tree. A tree is about different, different kind of species of tree. It's about photosynthesis. It's about its connection to, let's say... Um, um, the natural environment. You can, you can always connect that with climate change, the body system, so on and so forth. So it's not just a simple idea of tree, but later on, we build up our knowledge, knowledge connected to a tree. Equilibration. A child finds the balance a connection between external and external thinking processes. For example, with this one, when we are teaching children, so we, we, we bring in information in the head of our children, but the same child children always find ways to connect that to the experiences. There's, it is not only an internal process, getting inward, but it's also about external process, getting outward, way, making sense about it inside our head, to what is happening outside our head, what is inside our mind, and what is outside our mind. So when we're talking about, let's say, um, counting money inside the classroom, the child would always link that when they, for example, get into the experience of getting a cold store, buying something. A scheme is the process of sorting out information into categories. So part of our nature is not, as, as a human being, as a thinking being, is not only about putting information in our, man, in, in our mind, our head, but we have our capability to organize all the information into different schemes. So, so as you look here into these blocks, so we are capable of coming up with different um, uh, presentation of the blocks in our head coming up with this one this one this one this one that one we can always categorize that locating okay, a scheme in terms of colors as for example when we're talking about words we can create different schemes about words just for example words as part of speech so talk about part of speech as an adjective adverb noun pronoun so on and so forth and of course, to talk about words is part of a sentence, paragraph, essay, or writing a project. So just with a single word, board, then you can create different schemes, organization of, of, of words into different categories. Next. You always have to remember, it, it might look so simple, but cognition is very, very complex. But I'll try to, to make it more practical for you so that when you step, step inside your classroom and we think about cognition, 
Can you be able to to think about this? How, how can you probably apply this inside my classroom? Right? So let's try to see how exactly cognition would work for you as a teacher and for the students as learners. So cognition is, is just is not just a, a not just only about blank slate that an empty space or in field all the information all the uh, all the knowledge okay and aside from that the moment it gets into our head it goes into different directions okay it 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 is like a a huge huge space where you can you can play around with it and it go it can go different different direction and we can fill up as much as we can as well as teachers as a student we can fill up our mind okay and this is exactly our role as a teacher so as much as the brain or as much as the mind can go into different direction but if you really want to maximize how our mind works, we need to find a way to control it. Okay? That is why education is so important. Educating, educating children is very, very important because we provide children opportunity to control information, to control how our mind works. So, our basic our basic role as a teacher is to train children how to control the mind. So you see the difference from the video that we have here. It's like when we take control, we provide a, we regulate what is happening in our mind. So it's not just a chaotic situation but the the mind is also capable of creating a certain path and that is the role of education and that is your role and that is our role as a teacher so in that sense we, we create an, an an occasion by which children will be able to focus on something that as teachers we guide children okay we have to focus on this we have to pay attention to this one. So in terms of, for example, in terms of language, we're going to focus on how to construct a sentence. For example, in terms of math, my math is, is a huge, huge area. So we're going to focus on this, to solve a specific equation, to, to control what's happening in our mind. We are going to lead the children to a certain path. Again, there is again. It is not at all simple about focus control. For example, you have you have children. Let's have forty children inside the classroom. Thirty to fifty children inside the classroom. So how are you going to help the children to take control of what's happening in the head if you have fifty or thirty students inside the classroom? But that's very very challenging. But if we really want to understand how cognition works, then we really have to pay attention on how we can actually train each of these each of these child to take control of their own mind in terms of thinking. Okay. So speaking about taking control, so let's get into more specific on how we can help children take control, to take control of their own learning. So first, what we need to, to, to do to train children about cognition is, is to, to have the understanding that child learns through senses. So child, we have to maximize the senses. We basically learn by using our senses. This is about what is about trying to understand what what I see, what I hear, 
trying to question about trying to make sense of, of knowledge in terms of how how our senses, our um, sensory function makes sense of the knowledge of your presenting to children. So when we are preparing, when we are preparing our lesson for children in terms of really sharpening the cognition of children, so we have to to be aware on what what senses am I going to emphasize here? Is it the vision? Is it the auditory? Is it about the feeling? Is it about the tastes? It's about, it is about what they smell. So at the end of everything, it is like, so children will be able to understand deeply on, on what you present to them as an information when they be able to connect that with, with their senses. Because primarily, Children learn by observations. So you have to sharpen the way children observe. As you sharpen cognition, if you want to sharpen cognition, sharpen the way children observe. Next. Children understand the world from the teacher's point of view. So, it, it is... It is important for us to realize that whatever we feed children, definitely children will, will adapt, will, will accommodate. It's like children will believe us. Very often, very often children would even believe more teachers than they, than they believe their parents. So this is an opportunity really to, to really pass on a, um, how do you call this, a, a more conscious effort on really feeding children something that would be very, very useful for them when they become adults. Okay? Because whether we like it or not as teachers, our point of view will become the point of view of children. We just have to make sure we are doing it the right way. Next is the child learns with a set of logical rules, standards, procedures, patterns, and structures to solve problems. So we create a structure in the mind of children on how to solve a specific situation or a specific problem. So at first, especially for, let's say for, for the primary years of children, we create a foundation for them. So given, given a specific problem, this is the way to solve them. But later on, when they get used, when they get used to these different procedures, then in the latter stage of their of their learning process, they will be able to mix up things to solve to solve problems. Next, a child with information experiences progress in thinking process. As they grow, they are capable of thinking from the lower order to higher order. To, to higher order so children we, we provide an opportunity um, an occasion for children to to try different ways of thinking from a simple uh, process of thinking to a more complex way of thinking to a lower order of thinking to the higher order of thinking Cognition grows with our biological development. And just for example, g given this equation, okay, if you present this equation, if you present this equation to this to this toddler, how how will how will he respond to this equation? Does it make sense to him? Does it mean well, not at all? Okay, how would this one respond to this one? And how it is how will this child at that age would respond to this one? And how will this one respond to this one? And how will this adult respond to this one? So generally in terms of really um, solving the equation, who among them will be able to solve the equation? This one, this one. 
the fourth one and the fifth one. Why? Because they they have more experiences, they have more knowledge, they have more information in solving this one. Okay, so our learning um, goes side by side with our developments, as we've mentioned a while ago. That learning is about is is connected with our development. And to make it very, very realistic here, so we have basic stimulus here, ball pen and paper. So we have an adult here responding to the stimulus, and we have a toddler here responding to stimulus. So we see here it's like the child is, is not even prepared in terms of her motor skills. And again, her experience is does not match yet our expected, um, how we expect a person to respond to the bulletin in the paper, okay? But in terms of somebody who had an experience already, who has been, um, has knowledge already, definitely, um, our expected standard in terms of using the bulletin in paper, she will be, he will be able to actualize that but in terms of child, so her brain is not fully developed yet, right? Yes, in terms of accommodating any information. So this is the way she responds to it. So now we understand how the developmental aspects are connected to learning. Okay, so the next one is, this is also very much related to so making use of senses. So, so speak at the level. So we are now, um, by the way, we are now into some basic instructional strategies inside the classroom. So when we are teaching children, we are making, uh, we speak at the level children can understand. So you don't really have to, to really to change your voice or mimic the children or sound like Mickey Mouse or sound like cartoony. So that will be entertaining to children. I mean, there's nothing wrong about that. You can do it from time to time, but using it a daily, daily, I mean, as a daily thing for you to be changing your voice like Mickey Mouse, and come on. I mean, you will sound crazy, you know. But what does it mean when you speak at the level children can understand? So what does children use? They Children make use of their own, I mean, of their own language. They use their own images. They use their own imagination. They use their symbols. They use um, graphics that are meaningful to them. So look into what what I mean the way the way children communicate, and you will have to use that so that you'll be able to connect with them. So p fundamentally, when you're talking about speaking at the level of children, so you have to find a way to connect. Just to connect with children, and one way of connecting with children is using a language that they have been using okay so you have to look at yourself you have just seem to be have to be at, at yourself for example because there's time there are times that we feel as an adult that things it will be easier for children to understand but you have just have to be very very sensitive how how will children really understand the uh, the information that i will be giving them Again, as I mentioned um, earlier, I mean, maximize the senses also, okay? The next one is design and develop learning materials at children's level. level. So it's very much related also to the communication process. So there are materials that are more appropriate, more fitting to uh, more fitting to grade four student, more fitting to grade one student, more fitting to grade six students. So you just don't mix up things. You don't use your grade one materials for grade six students. You don't use for your materials for grade six. I mean, using your grade six materials for grade one students. So it will not. I mean, um, uh, what they call this? It, it will not work. It will not work. So you will, you will have to adapt to what the, the children are capable of in terms of their level.
And the next one is introduce different ways of thinking. And there's so many ways of thinking when you go to the course um, cognition. This is just an introduction. So when you go to the course um, cognition, okay, that's probably in your third year, uh, you'll be able to, to get into different ways of thinking. But just for, for, for just to give you a glimpse, but there are different ways of thinking. And when you're introducing a specific way of thinking to children, take it one at a time. Don't mix it up. Um, yes, for example, um, So when, when you want to, to take control of the learning of children, as I mentioned earlier, you have to, to take it um, one at a time. For example, you start with remembering, focus on remembering first. So what are the lessons that focuses on remembering? Then you focus on the understanding and then focus on applying. Then focus on your lesson and analyzing things. Okay, so you need to have some kind of focus so that children will be able to, to really create a habit. So this is the way to evaluate. This is the way to apply. This is the way to create. This is the way to be critical in terms of thinking. This is the way to be creative in terms of thinking. So take it one at a time so that they will be able to really, you know, to um, master a specific way of thinking. Don't mix it up. Yeah, don't mix it up. The next one, activities uh, provide children and activi activities that will help children that will help them explore and discover. So when you're talking, for example, about climate change inside the classroom, best way for them to for the children to understand climate change is to bring them out and see what's happening around and, and provide an opportunity for them to really, let's say, um, provide solution into the problem of climate change. Okay. And when you bring out children so they'll be able to explore more and discover more, it's always a connection, connecting what is happening inside the classroom again to the real world. Okay. This is very, very important. Training about cognition is about, for us teachers, about always asking questions, open-ended questions. What is open-ended question is about not asking questions answerable um, with yes or no, but asking questions like why, why did it happen, how did it happen, how will you explain the changes happening in the world right now, okay? Another thing that is very, very, very important is not only about you, we teachers asking a question, okay, an open-ended question, but it's also about children being able to ask question. So create an, a, 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 an occasion by which children will not be afraid to ask you to throw questions, to throw challenging questions, no matter how um, trivial the question is, no matter how simple the question is. Create a, an opportunity for children to ask questions. That is one of, what do you call this, the immeasurable element that will tell, that will tell, that will describe that children are growing cognitively that they are able to ask questions. Next, another thing that you will have to avoid is spoon feeding, or very often we call this as a direct instruction. Let me let nothing wrong about there. There's times that we do direct instruction. You just make sure that when, when you are doing direct instruction, it should be engaging for children also. Because otherwise, because children, especially for the 21st century children, they are very much um, uh, exposed to technology. And when you're bringing in a, 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 what do you call this, a very traditional way of teaching, do you think children will be listening to you? Do you think children will be very, very interested 
in the information that you're getting them. Again, avoid spoon feeding. In short, don't bore children. Don't let them sleep. The next one is children with their curiosity learn by trial and error. This is very similar to what I mentioned a while ago. Let me let, let them learn by mistake. So allow children to, to discover things by themselves. And definitely when you discover things, you will encounter error. And what is very crucial about this is that when they encounter error, create an opportunity for them to correct the error. It's not that's you correcting the error, but for them discovering that there must be a mistake here, there must be an error here, I should correct that error. Because there are times we just take these things for granted. And this is a very, very important condition. The children will be able to, to pinpoint the gaps in learning. And they will be able to question that. But at the same time also, they will find a way to, to resolve to resolve that gap, to feel that gap. Okay, don't forget about that. So it's not just, I mean, don't just focus, because there are some teachers just are focusing on error. You're wrong, you're wrong. But focus on children, recognizing what is wrong, but very importantly, children finding ways to resolve the mistake or to correct the error. The next one is, uh, we have we have to find a way to discover how children think. And again, this is a very, very challenging thing. Especially, again, when you have, I mean, the number of children inside the classroom. You have 30 children in the classroom. But what, what makes teaching really very exciting is when you realize how diverse they are, how different they are in terms of thinking. But it's not only about that. So... So given their differences, how can I probably help the child to find their own path in terms of cognition? Because whether you like it or not, children would have their own path in terms of thinking. There's a certain kind of thing that will fit them very, very well. Probably a more creative way of thinking, a more critical way. Again, um, again, this is just, just a follow-up on what I mentioned a while ago. Is for example, you're teaching them math. Give them this equation, and let's say you only have five children in front of you. But if you're really paying attention on to their individual differences, each child will respond to this equation differently. Perhaps this child would be able to answer it right away when I mean, his mind is into it in symbolic math. But perhaps this child would, would find it difficult to really understand this symbolic math. He will find a way to connect that to, to the reality. How am I going to make use of this math into the, in the real world? If I'm going to the cold store, am I really going to use this equation to buy things? So, so these things, you have the, what I'm trying to point out is that you just simply have to be aware of how each child in the classroom thinks because that awareness will make teaching more exciting. Children connect classroom learning with real and actual, real and actual experiences of the world. Let's, for example, we're talking about uh, energy conservation or energy coming from the air. So you're not just presenting to them a kind of miniature of, um, of this energy device, but when you, when you ask children to look into some real example, for example, in the Internet, so they would be able to realize, oh, this is not just a toy. This is really creating an energy 
and this is very i mean very helpful to the humanity in terms of providing a an alternative an alternative to the providing energy to the people okay And again, related to that, children develop cognitively as they explore their goal. So classroom is just a, a is, 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 is just a grounding. But going deeper into the ground of learning, we have to connect what is happening in the classroom to the real world. Because at the end of the day, children will be moving out of the classroom. It's, classroom is not a permanent thing to them what is permanent to them is the world so how are, how would they be able to use the knowledge inside the classroom to respond to the real world and for example we are now in in, in a very um, chaotic situation a very challenging situation for example when you, when you get when you go back to our classroom when all these things are over and all this pandemic is over, then perhaps we can make use of that as part of our realistic context in making and connecting science in responding to the real problem of this world, the virus. So as a child, how are we going to prevent this? How am I going to protect my life? How, how am I going to help my grandmother and my parents to survive this deadly virus. Okay, this one, this is very, very important in, in really shaping cognition. Give time, give time for children to digest and process information. Avoid information overloading. If, for example, children would have six subjects in one in a day, from 8 o'clock in the morning, let's say, to 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they have six side subjects. They think with this, the children will really be able to digest and really process the information. Okay? And some children might not be really able to contain all this information in their head. But we have, you know, we, our curriculum is pressing them so hard to, to digest everything. But our mind has its own capacity, potential, and limitation. And this capacity, potential, and limitation are different from children, from child to child. Okay? So take note of that because we might be destroying children if we don't give them I mean, a, an opportunity to process the information and we're only giving them an overloading and overloading and overloading. Connect thinking in developing useful and practical skills. Um, example with this one, um, it's like when, whenever, whatever, whatever I'm teaching, whatever subject I'm teaching, I always have to find a way to connect that to a specific skill that they can, they can probably use in the future. For example, with music, connecting language to music, connecting science to music, connecting what else, mathematics to music or. Uh, for example, example, a kind of gardening or cooking, whatever. We just have to connect a certain idea as something that will become more meaningful to them or something that is connected to their interests. And avoid being too abstract. You know, what is abstract is just everything is about ideas, but there's no connection to the reality. Okay? Because children always have to look some for something that is real okay so make use of abstract thing i mean you can use of abstract thing and connect that to reality connect child's interests experiences worldview and prior knowledge we don't have to underestimate we don't underestimate what children know we don't under Estimate. We don't overlook their own worldview. Okay, as much as children would respect and grab our own point of view as teachers, 
but as teachers also we also have to to get into to dive into the world of children because the moment we get into the road that makes learning exciting right so again connect with children's interests experiences worldview and prior knowledge because if you are the children are connected to their to their own worldview they they will they, they get hooked into that just like for example this video they're so hooked into what they're trying to, to look at because they're most probably is very much connected to their own interests okay um as i've mentioned earlier again i already mentioned that pay attention to cognitive diversity because there's children are just entirely different from each other in terms of cognition and related to the diversity of children you will get into this when you when you talk about inclusive classroom and exceptional you have a course on this inclusive classroom and exceptional children because in terms of learning there there's always an exception to a specific theory for example you have children who are really very exceptional it goes beyond your standard curriculum they are so advanced in terms of thinking but there are some children who might be just slow because of their um, biological limitation so these are the things that you, you, you need you need to to pay attention to because the way they think the way they respond is to learning stimulus will be entirely entirely different from each other okay as a teacher regardless of diversity we have to create an opportunity an equal, equal opportunity for all children to develop their their cognitive skills within their capacity potential and limitation and i would like to em emphasize this one we have to give children an equal opportunity regardless on how different they are in terms of gender in terms of socioeconomic condition but we provide them an opportunity to really sharpen their cognitive skills which is really very very important when they become adults in terms of solving solving problems in terms of coping with the challenges of life but we have to be aware of their own capacity, potential, and limitation. But not only that, we have. We really want to shape the cogn the, the cognitive um, aspect of children. They too have to be aware of their own capacity. This is my own capacity in terms of my thinking. This is my potential in terms of thinking, and this is also my limitation in terms of thinking. and um, before we end this this module these are the questions they would like us to reflect upon so we make use in answering this question we make use of the cognitive theory meant to make sense of this question so first question is why do children think differently as a teacher how will you manage cognitive diversity in your own classroom the second is what are the challenges that you will encounter in using cognitive theory of learning? What are the issues? What, what may probably be the gap in using the cognitive theory of learning? For example, in teaching language, in teaching math, in teaching science, or, or whatever, whatever we teach, whatever course we teach. And the third one is based on the theory, what are the elements that you need to consider in preparing a lesson for children? and to be very to, to more specific how are, go, how, are go, how, how are we going to prepare a lesson that that is responsive to the needs of Zainab how can cognitive theory how can we make use of the theory to, to really motivate children to be to engage in the learning process so given also going back to, to number one given the diversity of children how are you going to assess them if you are using the standard the standard curriculum and to fully end this okay let me end with this with this phrase with this sentence when we train children how to think 
they will choose not to stay behind. If you create an awareness on children how to think, this is my capacity, this is my potential, and this is my limitation. So given this one, then I will choose my own path. And when children are given that, that choice, then we give the children a fair chance to really survive this world, then definitely no one among your students will stay behind. Okay, that's all for now. Thank you so much for listening. And as I've always said, take care of yourself. Stay healthy. Be mindful of, um, of your own wellness. And God bless you all. Thank you again.